Anybody needs them? I I don't even know how to describe it. No, she is very There is maybe people come late to sleep in the back there. Okay. There is a well known midrash that says that King David was only supposed to live for a instant. And this was revealed to Adam Harishon. And Adam Harishon gives, you've heard this, right? Um, what is, what is it, how much does Adam Harishon give him? I uh, see so you all know this, good. So Adam Harishon gives 70 years, he was supposed to live a thousand. He gives 70 years to David, and David lives 70 years, and Adam Harishon therefore lives 930 years. Now, this is a well known midrash. And we sort of have to ask ourselves a number of questions based on this midrash. First of all, how can you give years from your life to another? Why wouldn't God grant King David to begin with those years? What would have happened had Adam not given the years to King David? And why does he only give seven? Right, there are so many questions about this idea and obviously we have to ask what is the message of this midrash so obviously when adam gives his life to elu to david the midrash is telling us that there's an integral somehow some sort of bond between adam and david that had Adam not, given those years, Adam never would have existed. So in other words, you have to look at David as almost being a continuation of uh, Adam in a certain way. Now, if you think about it for a minute, there are a certain amount of similarities between David on one hand and Adam on the other in between their life experiences. Anybody? David and Adam. Similarities between the life experiences. Okay, I'll help you. Both of them. One kid killed another. Uh, we got somebody. One I, 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 killed another one. I apologize that I'm not hearing you correctly, but there is somebody in, in Zoom land who has an idea. But the idea here is first of all, both of them, their major sin is associated with a woman. Both of them have sons who one son kills the other son. Both of them were forced out of their comfortable location. Adam is kicked out of Gan Eden and David has to run away from his palace. Both men sin and both men go through some sort of tshuva process. So you see that we spoke about that last year, Adam and Chuva, for those of you who are with us. So that what you see here is almost that there's like a some sort of you know symbolic repetition in the life of David from the life of Adam. Uh, Adam. Now I think what's significant here is also is what does King David's goal in the world? King David, as you know, what he really wanted to do was he wanted to rebuild the Mikdash. And God tells him, you can't. But what was the motivation? What is the rationale behind the Beit Mikdash? The rationale behind the Beit Mikdash is that it's supposed to be almost like a mini Gan Eden. That's what the Mikdash is. And the Mishkan was as well. And this idea of one place on earth 
where there is a special connection, something unique to between God and the people. So that when David, so when, when David is trying to recreate, rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, what essentially is David trying to do? He's trying to bring the world back to... Uh, he's, thank you. He's trying to recreate that concept of the Beit HaMikdash. And we are looking today at Mizmar 24. Mizmar 24 is um, a Mizmar that was written by David. And the Medrash tells us that this Mizmar is so uh, unique that it's as it could have been written by Adam HaRishon himself. And the Medrash says that only in four places. And the Torah describes, in last week's Parsha, the action of creation, right? God sees, he builds, he develops, all kinds of words that God uses. There, we have the same terminology used when the Jews are building the Mishkan. So in other words, the same creating, um, using, sanctifying, blessing, behold, the same terminology appears in both situations. So that creation of the world is God creates the world for mankind, and then humanity creates the Mishkan as a place for God to dwell. God builds the earth for humanity to dwell, and then humanity builds the Mishkan as a place for God to dwell. Also, both of them have kruvim, right? Right, the creation of Gan Eden has the kuvim outside of it, the kuvim in the Mishkan. Both of them have an eitz hadat, right? There's the eitz hadat in the garden. And what is the eitz hadat in the Mishkan? The, not only the Torah, the, the, the Torah is the eitz chayim that is in the Aron. Uh, the world has the sky, earth, and water. The Mishkan and the Kodesh Kedosh has the Azara, the Kodesh, and the Kodesh Kedoshim. So you see there are all kinds of symbolisms between those two ideas. Now, David, as we've said, cannot build the Mikdash, but he does what he can in order to move it along. And one of the things that he does is, as you know, he purchases the Makom HaMikdash. And under what situation does David purchase that Makoma Mikdash? Remember, there's a plague, and David sees the Malach, and the Malach stops at a certain location, and David understands that that's the place for the uh, Mizbeach, and he buys it. And according to the Radak, he writes this Mizmar when he purchases the Makom HaMizbeach. So again, right away, what we're establishing now is that this Mizmar is somehow connected to the Beit HaMikdash, which is connected to creation, which is connected to Adam HaRishon. Now let's look at the Mizmar. And while we're reading the Mizmar, now let me just give a little side commercial here. There are basically two ways to learn, to, well, I'm sure there's many ways to learn Tehillim. One way of learning Tehillim is to go through it pasuk by pasuk and talk about the details. I personally prefer to look at the chapter globally rather than going through the pasuk pasuk. And that I think is the approach that we are going to take over because I think it's easy to remember concepts rather than the pearls. Okay, so let's read the Mizmar. You have it here in Hebrew, you have it in English. It's a Mizmar that you recognize, by the way, from many places. This is a Mizmar that we say a lot, okay? Well, first of all, the reason we're doing it now is because what we're going to be doing the next seven weeks is we're going to be doing the Shir Shel Yom. So this is the Shir Shel Yom of Sunday, and so we're starting with that. But where else do you recognize this Mizmar from? Okay, when we return the Torah on Monday, Thursday, Mincha and Shabbat, this is a Mizmar that is associated with returning of the Aron. Also, we're just coming off the Yamim Noraim. 
right? This Ms. Morris said line by line in the Amim Norim, and you have to say like, there's so many Ms. Morim, why is this, why does this Ms. Mar play such a role in the Amim Noraim as well. So let's read it. I'll read it in Hebrew. You follow along in English. And remember, it's something that we always do when we read the Mizmar is you want to somehow subdivide it into sections. So keep that in mind as we're reading it. Lidavid Mizmar. La Shem Ha'aretz Umlo'a Tevel Va. Now you'll notice, by the way, in terms of the poetry here, the first half of the sentence parallels the second half of the sentence. So Ha'aretz is Tevel. Let's write Hashem Ha'aretz Umlo'o Tevel Vyoshveva. Who ki who al yamim yisoda? Part one. The al nehorot yichonaneha. Part two. Parallel. Mi yale b'har Hashem a umi yakum b'mkom kadsho. You see the repetition, A and B repeat themselves. Now, so that's a question. Here's the answer. So now, if indeed this Mizmar is, as we're saying, is connected to the purchasing of the Makom HaMikdash, it makes sense to us here, source number one, the Rambam. The Rambam here in Hilchot Beit HaBechira, chapter two, tells us, and you have it in English on the next page, so we'll search there. It is universally accepted that the place on which David and Shlomo built the altar, you can notice there also, the Rambam, uh, Rambam already says that it's although Shlomo writes the Beit HaMikdash, because David builds the altar, he is being associated here on the threshing hold of Ornan, is the location where Avraham built the order, the altar on which he prepared Yitzchak for sacrifice. You all know that. Noah built an altar on the location when he left the ark. There you've got your Parsha, Dvar Torah. It was also the place of the altar on which Cain and Hevel brought their sacrifices. And similarly, Adam, the first man, offered a sacrifice there and was created at that very spot. As our sages said, man was created from the, play, from the place where he would find atonement. The Mizbeach gives atonement, and humanity was created from that place, and therefore the Mizbeach can bring them some sort of, of uh, forgiveness. So we understand that this place that where the Beit HaMikdash stood is a one that, first of all, comes back to Adam. Again, here's our creation to Adam. And it is the one that is somehow associated with David when he purchases the, the Aron. There is an alternative explanation that it wasn't necessarily said when Adam, when David bought the place, but you know what happens? David brings the place. And where is the Aron? Remember, they had taken the Aron to the battlefield and it had been captured and it was by the Philistines and they send it back. And, and then David brings the Aron up to Yerushalayim. And the first time he brings it up, that doesn't work out so well. And then he has to bring it up a second time. Okay, so when, according to the Radak, which you have here in source two in Hebrew, I apologize, but it says, Ledavid Mizmar, Zeha Mizmar Chibru David, Sheyomru Oto, Kisheyich Nasu Ha'aron Lebeit Kodesh HaKadoshim. That he wrote it originally with the intention of when the Beit HaMikdash was going to be built, you were going to say this chapter. But in addition to that, he himself said when they brought the Aron, which explains to everybody sitting here, why do we say this Mizmar when we bring the Torah back into the Aron? The uh, Aron. 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 That's right. So we have a repetition here of history, which I think is a, gives us a, very, a nice you know, idea that this is something that's happening for many years. Now, um, Let's start talking about, so there is that in terms of background, let's start going back and looking at the structure. So 
Anybody find a way of dividing this into sections? Anybody want to make a suggestion? There, you can't be wrong because it's poetry. Into two sections. Okay. I would go one through six as the first and then seven. Okay, so here I'm going to teach you a little trick. And that is, you see at the end of Pasuk Vav the word Sela. So many times, Sela doesn't really have an English translation. Um, and many commentators view Sela exactly as you said, as like, you know, break, break, end of idea. So one way of dividing it is, as you say, one to six and seven to ten. Go ahead. Okay, you could do it that way in sections because it's ten, it's ten verses, two, 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 and two. I will accept that as well. That's what I'm saying. There's no correct answer here. Um, and what, the way I'm going to look at it here is I'm actually going to look at it as, as you say, the first two verses together, Aleph and Bet as a couplet. Then I'm going to do three to six as section two. And then I'm going to do seven to 10 as the last section. Now, if we look at one and two, the theme of one and two is, I think that's pretty clear. If you had to sum it up, God's creation, but not only God, it's, it's God, it's God's football and he makes the rules. Okay, that's one and two. God makes it, it all belongs to him. Three to six, first of all, by the way, we'll talk about it seems to be some sort of give and take here. And it tells us basically that who can enter before God? Somebody who is ethically, moral, upright. And finally, seven to 10, talk about God's entrance into gates and his relationship to mankind, which we'll have to analyze. Now, I've pointed out to you this before, modern commentators, whenever they see three sections or sections that seem to have nothing to do with each other, they come along right away and say, well, it was different chapters. And they actually like to say that one to six was one chapter, as you say, Sela, and seven to 10 were a different chapter. And so we're gonna have to try to show that indeed these three units are really cohesive. So let's go back to the beginning. So the beginning establishes that the arets and all that's in it belongs to God. Now, according to the commentators here, they, they said, you know what? There are plenty of people in the world who believe that God created the world, but then they believe that, that's right, he left, he died, he's busy, I don't know, but he's, you know, he's gone. And the point here is to say that, no, not only does God create the world, but he is constantly involved in it. But if you look at source number two, source number two goes back to that Radak that I pointed to you before. You'll notice that the Radak says, the Haaretz, the land, he kolelet kol Haaretz. That is all of the universe. But if you look in Rashi, in source number three, once it's on the next page, if you look at Rashi, Rashi says when it says, la Hashem Haaretz, the world belongs to God. There, Rashi says, what are we obviously referring to? It's the land of Israel. So that the beginning of the sentence, la Hashem ha'aretz umulo'o, God has a special relationship to the land of Israel, tevel v'yoshveva, and the rest of the world and the inhabitants there. So that according to Rashi, it's not a direct repetition, but rather it refers to God's special relationship with the land of Israel and then his relationship to the rest of the world. I just want to point out, it doesn't fit into our theme, but I couldn't go further without pointing out to you source number four. Source number four is the Gemara in Brachot that tells us that, that, that this Pasuk, La Hashem Haaretz Umulo'ah, is the source that we have Birchat HaNehenim. How do you know that you have to make a bracha before you eat? Because we know that, you know, Berchat is a Berchat Deoraita. Berchat are not 
uh, in the in the uh, Torah. Similarly, we have Yehuda said that Reb Shmuel said, one who derives benefit from this world without a blessing is as if he enjoyed objects consecrated to heaven as it states, the earth and all it contains is the Lord's, the Lord, the world and those who live in it. That's our pasuk that we're talking about. Rebbe Levi expressed this concept differently. Rebbe Levi raised the contradiction. It says the earth and all and all it contains is the Lord, right? We said that, la'aretzum la'ol. But we also have the pasuk in Tehillim that says, shamayim shamayim la'ashem, la'aretz natan levnei adam. Wait a minute, so we have one pasuk that says, you know, God gave us the earth, and then we have this other pasuk that says, well, the earth belongs to God. So how does Rebbe Levi answer it? There is clearly a contradiction with regard to whom the earth belongs. He himself resolved the contradiction. This is not difficult. Here, the verse says that the earth is Lord's, refers to the situation before a blessing. And here it says that he gave the earth to mankind, refers to after the blessing. And so that's just a side point that this is the source for Brechat Hamazon. Now, we know that at the beginning, we know from, from the Suez Sims Parsha, originally when God created the world, the world was covered with water. And then God drew back the water and to reveal the continents. And we, all, we know this from today's geology, that the continents actually sit on, on water. And, you know, California and Florida are sinking, right? Um, we know those kind of things. But the idea here is that God creates the creation and he maintains that creation on a daily basis. And his maintenance of creation is not just you know, out of the blue, it's actually dependent on the next part of the psalm. The next part of the psalm asks a picture. Who will ascend to the mountain of God and who will rise in its holy place? And without looking at the Midrash, we would expect what would the answer be to that question? If you ask modern day people, you know, who's spiritual, who's connected to God? You know, they'll tell you people who, you know, are davening all day, people who are, I don't know, you know, learning Torah all day. But that's not the answer that we get in the um, Pasuk. The Pasuk very clearly answers that who is it who can approach God? He who is ethical and moral. And this is the answer that is given. Now, it could be, by the way, if we're talking about approaching the Har Hashem, who approaches Har Hashem on a practical level? Besides the priests who are already there, it could be the people who were the pilgrims, the Ole Regal. They're coming up to Ali Ali Regal and they call out, Mi Yale Bahar Hashem. And the priests answer back to them, Niki Kapayim Uvale Vav. And then the people respond, Zed Dor Durashav. So that's why I'm also understanding it that it's this give and take. But either way, I think we do we understand it really as a rhetorical question? Who can approach God? Does it, I mean, can't everybody approach God? Aren't we all his creations? So what essentially are we talking about? And what essentially are we asking that that sort of question? So first of all, I think the first thing that needs to be pointed out it is essentially, the answer here is basically there are three things that you need to do in order to develop a relationship with God. You need to be Nikika Payim Uvar Levav, Asher Lo Nasa Lashav Nafshi, and Velo Nishba Lemirma. Those are the three things. And you will notice that, we'll get them in English, that we have them right here. Thank you for pointing out. It's verse number four. He has clean, clean hands and a pure heart. He does not take my name in vain, and he is not sworn deceitfully. Okay, so first of all, you'll right away notice that you can divide these three things into three categories. Action, speech, and thought. So that in order to be considered a good person, you have to have you have to have it in action and in speech and in thought. Now you notice the interesting here. Let's just talk about these characteristics. Two of them are positive, and two of them are negative. Right? Two of them. You have the two lows. Somebody who does not 
somebody who does not take the name in vain and somebody who has not sworn, those are negatives. And the positive, somebody who has clean heart, clean hands and pure heart. Now I want you to see, if you look at this two um, terminologies uh, parallel, Niki Kapayim Uvar Levav. So first of all, you have lave and hand, heart and hands, that's a pair. And then you have clean heart, clean hands and pure heart, clean and pure are pairs. Okay? So it's like you have to look at it as a pair. And so how would you understand, if I lay that term to you, Niki Kapayim, clean hands, how do you understand that phrase? None of you all understand it's not uh, aqua gel. What, what, how do you understand clean hands? Somebody who hasn't done anything bad with their hands. Somebody who's honest. Right? Somebody who doesn't take things that sticky fingers, we call them, right? That doesn't belong to them. And I think that that's pretty clear. And so, and then who is the varle vav? Who is somebody who is pure of heart? What characteristic trait would you say is that? Loving. Loving people. They're not just jealous. Right, those negative traits, jealousy, anger, hatred, all of those who are sourced uh, within the heart. And so here, but I think what's the idea of putting those two together is that a righteous person has to be the same. What's inside the heart has to be on the outside. And that you can't, you know, go through these motions on the outside and really be a nasty, jealous, horrible person on the inside. So that's the combination of those two. And the last two also form a pair of both of them connected to speech. And um, there are different ways of understanding what does it mean that you don't swear deceitfully. And I think you will probably understand these in different ways. You don't trick people. You don't desire, you don't take, you know, trick people into giving you things that they don't want to. You don't accept false testimonies. You don't uh, misuse speech. All of those concepts. So here we have, again, let's just say, so we have the hands or the action. The varle vav is the heart. And finally, the speech is this, um, you don't speak improperly. So now the, pers the person who has these, key these traits in verse 5 tells us, he is the one or she is the one who is going to receive the blessing from God. Now, this is something that we are actually familiar with from the Nevi'im in many of the sources. Remember, the, these are the pilgrims who are coming up to the Beit HaMikdash or the Mishkan. What are they bringing with them? They're bringing sacrifices. And we know throughout Navi, God says, I don't want sacrifices. You cannot bribe me. What I do want is I want you to be good people, ben adam between man and man. You can't be nasty to your neighbor and then think you're going to go bring a carbon and it's all going to be fine and dandy. And there's so many different sources of it. I just bought you a few of the better ones. If you look here in source number um, five, source number five, remember, Saul tells um, the Navi Shmuel, that he left the animals alive in order to bring sacrifice. And he says to him, Shmuel says, does the Lord delight in birth sac offers and sacrifices? God doesn't want it. What does God want? God wants you to listen. And then Hoshea tells us in source six, Ki chesed zevach. That's even clearer. I want you to do good actions. I don't want your sacrifices. And finally, source seven says, Saneti Ma'asti Chagechem. This is very harsh. The Navi says, I despise those Karbanot Chagiga that you have brought. The Lo Ariach Ba'atzro Techem. And I will take no delight in your gatherings together. Ki im ta'aluli olot uminchotechem lo ertzeh. And even if you bring me up all the sacrifices in the world, I will not accept them and I will not look on your offerings because if you look in verse 24, that's what you need to do is you need to have justice and righteousness. How and why do we come up with the first 
The mitzvah of bikurim. The mitzvah of bikurim is a biblical is a biblical command. God commands us to bring the first of the fruit. That is a open well, puzzle. So the other, the question you really should be asking is where does Cain come up with the concept from? That, that's really a, a, a better question because you know how does he even come up with the concept of sacrifice? Right, because he is the first one to do it. But I said I'm going to have to leave that for now because I want to come up with the with the idea here of what exactly has happened here. And I think in a way, it's a little bit surprising to us that again, let's remember the question is, who is the spiritual person? And the answer is, who is the spiritual person? The one who is yeah. holy in action, speech, and thought. Now, remember we said again, when did, what was King David's rationale for writing this chapter? King David writes this chapter in order to have it as part of the inauguration of the Mikdash, which he so desires to build. Now, if I asked you this question, who is pure of heart, clean of hands, who doesn't speak unjustly, does King David fulfill any of those requirements? No. 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 Oh, you're fit. So nobody does. We'll get to that in a minute. But I'd like to point out to you that if you think about King David and you think about his terrible sin with Bathsheba, now we obviously don't have the time to analyze this sin in its entirety, but many of you know that Chazal do backflips to say that she wasn't married and therefore it wasn't, you know, a married woman and Uriah deserved to die because he rebelled against him and all kinds of justifications for David's behavior. So if so, if we say that, well, she really wasn't married and he really, um, you know, deserved to die anyway. So then what was David's sin? What did David do wrong? So I think if we use this chapter, this chapter clearly tells us David's intentions were not pure. His hands were not clean and he used speech in order to accomplish his motivation. So perhaps this is not only a general explanation to us. You want to be spiritual, do this way. It also helps us understand David's sin in his life. Who can approach God? Somebody who has these things. Who does not have these things? David. King David, and therefore he cannot build the Mikdash. Now you do point out, and I think that's true, that can we really answer, are any of us completely pure or is anybody so if he says this to the pilgrims who's coming up the koanim say well somebody who's pure and the pilgrims say oh yeah, we'll so now. what's the right well we'll just all go home now <laughs> so what's the answer no this is a very beautiful answer look at verse six verse six is the answer that the people say they say dar durashav mavakshe panecha yaakov zela such is the generation that seek after him, that seek your face, even Yaakov Salah. What essentially are the people answering? The people are essentially saying, we're trying, right? We're seeking. You're right, nobody, nobody can finally, nobody can answer that question, but you can turn around, and I hope, listen, after 120, I think when we get up to heaven, we might not be able to say to God, listen, God, we were perfect, but we can perhaps turn around to God and say, we tried, right? But more than that, I didn't hear teachers used to tell that to you, it's good just, you know, we should try type of answers. So I think that's exactly what the people here are saying. And that is the answer that they are giving here. And Sela indicates that break. So we had one and two, which discussed God creating the world and everything in it. Then we have, three to six, which discusses who is the spiritual man. And we say somebody who is ethical and who at least is trying to be good. And then we get to this last couple of verses. Now you will notice in the last couple of verses, first of all, it says Melech HaKavod. It says Melech HaKavod in five times in these four verses, which first of all indicates to us that David HaMelech knows his place. And it seems to be that David is asking for these gates to open. And the story tells us in source number nine, 
The Midrash tells us a very interesting story. In source number nine, it's actually the Gemara in Shabbat. The Gemara in Shabbat says like this, says God, says David to God, forgive me for the great sin. And according to Rashi, the great sin obviously refers to his sin with Bathsheba. God says to him, I forgive you. So David responds, give me a sign in my life. God responds, in your son's life, I will give a sign, not in yours. When Shlomo built the temple, he desired to bring the ark into the Holy of Holies, but the walls closed together as not to allow an entrance. Shlomo says, open the gates and let God in. The walls would not budge until Shlomo uttered the verse, remember for the sake of my father David, the gates opened up then and he brought in the ark. So the story here is giving us a little bit of background, and here I get, the Gemara gives a little bit more of explanation, that when Shlomo was ready to bring the Aron into the temple, he was unsuccessful. Now, the interesting thing is, even if we're not talking about actual gates that were locked, the dimensions of the Aron were bigger than the Kodesh HaKidashim. This we know, we have the dimensions. The dimensions of the Aron did not fit through the doorway. Shlomo offered 24 tefillot, and still, he is not successful in bringing the Aron inside. The gates ask Shlomo, who is Melech HaKavod? And Shlomo answers, Hashem. Still, the gates remain sealed, and only when Shlomo utters David's name do the gates open wide. It was then that the whole world learned that David had been forgiven for his sins. Yeah, but, but now, why do I have this repetition? of, you know, twice it says, once in seven and once in nine, that the gates should be open. And you will notice, by the way, that we have an, a, the verb changes. Look at seven and nine. The psukim are very close. In Hebrew, both of them su'u, she'ar mo'shechem. But in seven, it says vihinas u, And in nine, it says usu. So here in translation, it says, Vehinasu is and ye lift up, and ve suu is lift them up. Two different verbs. Here, Rav Hirsch has a fantastic explanation. Rav Hirsch explains that there are two barriers, two types of barriers between humanity and God. One set of barriers are the barriers that are man made. What is a man-made barrier between us and God? Our egos, disbelief, laziness. Those are all things that humans do to themselves. And that's why it is, vihinasu, by the way, is a singular term. So Rav Hirsch says, verse Zion refers to those man-made barriers. And he says the term vihinasu means it has to be forced. That in order to open those gates, those gates have to be forced open because humanity isn't ready necessarily to uh, open them up themselves. The next thing though is the next type of gates are those gates that are made by God, the barriers. What kind of gates are there between God and humanity? There's the whole Hester Punin, the whole fact that God is hidden and that he's not there and it's not always easy to see him and bad things happen to good people and all kinds of questions that help, that, that keep people away from God. So according to Rav Hirsch, what's being described here is two different historical time periods. Verse 7 and 8 refers to the time where God is hidden. It's hard to see God and if his face isn't revealed. But the one time, when do we see God? We sometimes see God in verse 8. What is verse 8? Talking about as a God is he is he born milchama. That we see God with his power. We see God with his warlike attitude. But verse 9 and 10 
refers to the messianic era. That when then, then first of all, God is going to have to force us. So therefore, the term is visu. It's going to be voluntary because everything is going to be so obvious about God. And so therefore, everybody will recognize God. And you don't have to recognize God as a God milchama. Now you're recognizing God as Hashem Tzvaot, which is translated as the Lord of hosts, which means that it's one that everybody recognizes and everybody accepts. So now, let's look at these three sections again. Section one was God creates the world. Section two is my responsibility as a human. And section three is the acceptance of God, either involuntarily or voluntarily. So now, how do we put these three, these three sections together? We see we actually have, first of all, an explanation for creation. God creates the world, and God actually wants to bring the world to perfection, back to Beit HaMikdash, back to the Garden of Eden. And how does how are we going to get to Messianic era? How are we going to get to the perfection? That's right. Humanity has to be that bridge between creation and Messianism, and people the people have to be that bridge by being good people. So this gives, it's the people in the middle that give creation on one hand and messianism the go. It means that we are going in a certain direction. And by the way, let me just point out, if you look at verse three, verse three are parallel, right? Mi ya le bahar Hashem, umi ya kum bimkom kacho. They seem to be who shall ascend to the mountain of the Lord and who shall stand on his holy place. Seems to be parallel but it's not. What is the difference between ascend, ya'ale, and stand, yakum? Ascending means that you're moving, that you're moving, right? <laughs> Only once, that you always have to be on this constant, and that I think is also part of this theme, the darshav, the seeking, that we as humans have to see at least to be trying. And so thus, in, rea in reality, this chapter actually represents a span of history. It starts with creation. It travels through humanity's responsibility, and it ends up in the messianic era. And in case you don't believe me, let's look at source number 10. Source number 10. Again, you want me to repeat it? Yes. Yes, if you look at verse 3, verse 3 has two verbs in it. Ya'aleh which means ascend, and yakum, which means stand. And so the first whole, the whole beginning has to be this constant thing of ascent. Because if you, you know, if you're not going up, you're going down. And stand, Go ahead. Yakum. And stand, that's when we which ultimately, that'll be the, when we finally get there. And maybe I'm just doing, I got mind moving, uh, not is to stand. Right. Yakum carries the idea of you're, you're, you're moving up, you're getting up. You are, so that's, that's what so you could say, is that once, that there is also, but you're in the same place. place. But there has to be this constant, as you say, up, strive for up, uh, for getting up there. So now if you look at verse number 10, if you look at source number 10, source number 10 is the verse in Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu tells us, Bayom HaHu, on that day, now whenever Yeshayahu talks about Bayom HaHu, he's talking about, Messianic era. Yushar Hashir Hazeb Eretz Yehuda. Here is the song that we are going to sing in Yehuda. Ir az lanu Yeshuat Yashit Chomot Vechel. We have a strong city with war, with you know defenses all around it, and God is going to save us. Pitchu Sha'arim Viyavo Go Tzadik. Many of you know that song. Shomer Emunim. Right, open the gates and the righteous nation that keeps faithfulness will enter in. So there too, we have this idea of the gates opening. When are those gates opening? In the messianic era. Now let's go back and decide why of all these Psalms, was this the Psalm that was chosen for Sunday? And you have it, by the way, in source number 11, source number 12. One is the Mishnah in Tamid, and the other is the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, where both of them say that 
what is the share that the Levium sang on the first day? They sang source uh, share number 24. So we understand why it comes back to the Torah that you will understand. But what is the significance to Sunday? Why is it Sunday? So the Gemara explains that what happened on Sunday? What's the Sunday? Yom Rishon starts, starts creation. And every day, Sunday is the beginning of the new creation. And the idea here, here by saying this parak, we're saying God created the world with a purpose. You as human beings have a role in this idea. And remember that we are going into a certain direction. I also want now, now, so we understand why you took the Torah, we understand Sunday. What's the connection to Rosh Hashanah? So here, this is my theory, but um, we know that the themes of Rosh Hashanah are Malchiot, Zichronot, and Shofrot, the kingdom, right? God is king. Zichronot, God remembers. And Shofrot, the blowing of the Shofar. So you have all three in the chapter. Think about it. The chapter begins with God as king. Then it moves on to the role of humanity. What does God remember? Human, humans' actions. And it ends finally with the blow. What is the ultimate blowing of the shofar is messianic era. So perhaps that's why this chapter is connected to the idea because you have um, those three themes as well. Now, the last point I want to make about this chapter is we said already that this chapter was written by David when he originally got the land connected to the Makom um, HaMikdash, uh, which, as we said, you know, was where Adam was created, where Cain and Hevel brought, where um, Akedat Yitzchak happened, all of that was continued. But if you remember that the way David gets, gets that land is he gets it um, as a result of the plague. And you have these verses here in source number eight. In source number eight, this is at the end of the plague, and it's a terrible plague, we, you know, uh, epidemic, I don't know if it was a pandemic of sorts. And God comes to David in source eight, verse 18, Shmuel Bet, chapter 24. Vayava God al David bayom hahu, vayomelo alei hakem lahashem mizbeach, begoran arnaya vaha yivosi. Go up and build this mizbeach. Vayal David kidvar God asher tziva Hashem. And David does this. And Arvana sees the king coming. The king says to him, I'd like your land. Arvona says to him, take it for free. David says, oh no. Notice, by the way, you know that there are three places that were purchased by our forefathers in the Bible. Those three places are Har Habayit, Shem, and Hebron. If you talk about the probably the three most, you know, nobody complains to us, you know, how come you're living in Ramad Granana? But those three places, that, <laughs> right, that we actually purchased those, there's just a certain irony there. Anyway, so the king, the king says, no, I'm not going to take it for you as a gift, but I'm going to pay for it. And David gives him that money. And David, Pasuk Hafei, Vayiven Shem David Mizbeach Lashem, and he builds the Mizbeach, Vayal Olot Ushlamim, Vayatar Hashem Le'eretz, Ata'atzer Hamagefa Me'al Yisrael. He builds the Mizbeach, he brings the sacrifices, and then, and only then, is the plague completely over, and, you know, it comes back to balance. Now, the question that you still have to ask is, how come we have to find the Makom HaMizbeach as a result of such a terrible plague? So here, in source 14 and 15, we have two answers. So the first answer is the Midrash and Shmuel, and it says, He says, all of those people who died in that plague, they 
The people who were living in David's time were good. They say, we're not missing anything. You know, we have David, we have freedom. They didn't feel like anything was missing. And take it a step further, the Radak tells us, first he brings that first sentence, and he says, he says, and we as humans should learn from this. He says, now remember Radak was somebody who lived in the Middle Ages. He had poverty, he had pogroms, he had, you know, all kinds of terrible things. He says, if the time of David, they were living in peace and they didn't search out God and say, send us the Beit HaMikdash. Anu, shahaya biyamenu, cherev, ubiyamenu al achat kama vakama. He says, how much more so do we have, an, do have a responsibility to turn to God and say, God, bring us back that Mikdash. Lefichach, het kinu zikanim v'nivim lita b'piyam shel Yisrael liyot m'palalim shel shapamim b'chol yom. And that's why we say three times a day in our prayers, Hashev shechinatcha u'machotcha l'tzion v'seda v'odatcha li Yerushalayim. Amen, Cain, yihi ratzon, sela. And so I think what the Radak is doing, the Radak is actually taking our Mizmar and saying that we have to take it a step further. And we have to remember that this is a Mizmar that we should be saying when the Mikdash will be rebuilt. And it's one that when we say Sunday and turn back to the, we have to remember that we are not, we have not yet reached the ultimate and we still should feel that something is lacking in our lives. And we should constantly pray not only for uh, Mashiach, but we also have to return for the return to Yerushalayim, the rebuilding of the Mikdash, and uh, our goal, our responsibility to be within that as well. Um, we have like one minute left, so let me take questions. Go ahead. This is, I, yes, this is the one the purchases in the Bible. Right. You know, so the, per three, the three purchases. David. That's David. Hebron, that Hebron is purchased by Ab I'll tell you, so let me repeat it for the people outside. So David purchases the the, the Makom HaMikdash. Hebron is purchased by Abraham. And Shechem is purchased by Yaakov. Yaakov. Remember what happened? He has the brothers with, with Dina. And he comes to fight with them. And afterwards, he purchases purchases that land. Yaakov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. David purchased it from, if you see, if you look at those psukim, he purchased it from a fellow whose name is Ar Arvona, Arvona, who seemed to Hayivusi, ha because the city was a Yivusite city, and he purchased it, you see, right there in that first verse. Uh, Arvona the Yivusite. Can I ask as many? Okay. Right. So um, the question for those of you who are saying here, the question was, if God doesn't want sacrifices, then why did he command them? And it's right, and we, we talk about, especially here in Rosh Chodesh, right, today in, in Davening, we spoke about the certain, so the ideal is you be a good person and you bring your sacrifices and that's the highest level. But it reached the point, and you know this, that especially there's certain, I don't want to point fingers, but there's certain religions where you can almost do whatever you want and you make a nice donation and they cancel it for you. And that's what, and that's what God is saying here, that you can't trick God. That you can't think, well, I bring sacrifices, I'm a holy person. That the sacrifice just has to be a manifestation, an outward manifestation of what's really happening inside. And the point of the sacrifice is to help us reach these levels and to help us, you know, connect to God and all kinds of reasons why God commanded it. But you can't just think that, you know, yeah, God, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. The word Korban Lord needs to bring us close. close. And it was a place in time when people appeased their 
Right. It's not the, the sacrifices are not for God as they were in other religions mm -hmm. to give them food, but the sacrifices were for humanity to help bring humanity closer to God. Because he doesn't anyway, right, because he doesn't need it. That's exactly right. But that was the whole pagan theory was about that. Go ahead. Just because you said that the people of the time of David thought they had everything. But Hashem said he didn't need a, 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 a house. place in a, a home in the world, a house in the world. He wanted the people to be. So in a way they did have once the, once the temple's built, the destruction is awful. But before it's built. Right, but just as David spent his whole time gathering up right but so the same thought. thing but he so the people there should have also been because the measure says david david was not supposed to build a bait to make dash the people could have oh, okay. anyway, that's right okay and then you all know well next week there's no place because it's election day the week after that we'll do the mizmar of monday Thank you.